This morning in your Bibles, if you please make your way to the book of James, chapter 2. James, chapter 2. Our focus is going to be on verses 18 to 26 today. This passage that James is writing about, he's dealing with faith without works is dead. And he's talking about, first of all, we've seen dead faith, which indeed is faith, like he said, without works, any evidence. It's dead. That's an intellectual assent. Remember we talked about Josh McDowell's testimony that he went several miles and he, he spent a lot of hours trying to doubt and defeat the teaching of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As he was in another country and he was studying, he saw that in his studies that there was uh, after 700 hours he came to the point to say, it's true. The teaching of the resurrection is true. But Josh McDowell went on to say that it was for several months later that he acted on what he knew to be true. That it was a hit on the ego and the pride that he said, I'm reliant upon Jesus Christ who went to the cross, who died there for me, who was buried and rose again the third day to place his trust to rely upon what Jesus did. And so that reality of the resurrection, that truth, it shows that he said he wasn't saved until that point in December of 1959, several months later. That was when, his, when he was saved. Now he had un understanding. A lot of people stop with that intellectual ascent of saying, I know that Jesus died. He, was, he died on the cross. He was buried. And he rose again. They may know it up here. But that's not salvation. That would be called, James said, dead faith. On your notes today, the first point is demonic faith. We say, wait a second, demonic faith? How can this be called demonic faith? Dr. Elmer Towns, a, a great professor at Liberty University, he would teach that this is demonic faith. This is a little bit different than dead faith. Dead faith is simply knowing the facts with the mind, but Demonic faith, well, let's pick up in verse 18 and we'll look and see what demonic faith is. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? So he has, first of all, a contrast between living faith and dead faith. Wearsby in his Bible Exposition Commentary writes, Being a Christian involves trusting Christ and living for Christ. You receive the life, then you reveal the life. I like that. You receive eternal life at the point of salvation. Jane, or the Gospel of John chapter 3 says, He who believes in the Son has life right now. He has life. But the one who does not know the Son, the wrath of God abides upon him. Because they have said no to the redeeming work of Jesus Christ at the cross. We were singing about it about coming before him with the righteousness of Christ, his righteousness alone, not based on our righteousness, because our righteousness is like filthy rags in the sight of a holy God. We cannot get to heaven on our own. We need Jesus. We need his righteousness applied to our account. And that's what God does when we place our trust, we believe in Jesus Christ. That is saving faith. So, Living for Christ, you receive the life, then you reveal the life. 
Verse 20, the Amplified Bible says, Are you willing to be shown proof, you foolish, unproductive, spiritually deficient fellow, that faith apart from good works is inactive and inactive, ineffective and worthless? An intellectual ascent without change of lifestyles. Verse 19, you believe that God is one. That word that is important there. In the Gospel of John, the word believe is used 98 times. But what follows the word believe is believe in or into Jesus Christ. It's relying upon the work of Christ. Believing in the completed work of what Jesus did, who he is. But here it's believed that. This is an intellectual ascent. It's the idea of having the knowledge, but not relying for him on salvation. And this is the difference that James is telling us. And it's a biblical difference. Point C, demons believe and shudder. Here's the difference between dead faith and demonic faith. Dead faith is intellectual ascent alone. What happened to Josh McDowell in that college library? When he said, it's true. But he went on with his testimony and said he was not saved at that point. He just knew the truth of the facts of God's word about Jesus Christ. You see how Satan does this to deceive so many? Because there are multitudes that think they're saved because they have intellectual assent alone, and that's dead faith. There will be multitudes in hell for eternity who didn't doubt the facts of Jesus dying on the cross, the burial, and the resurrection. But they hadn't placed their trust in Him for His righteousness to be applied to their account. Dead faith, demonic faith, not only do they believe or have the intellectual scent, but they tremble. There's an emotion involved. Now we said that the makeup of a person is intellect, emotion, and what is the third? Will. Dead faith is dealing only with the intellect. Now you have emotion. Even the demons believe and shudder or tremble. Do you realize that Felix, when the Apostle Paul was witnessing and was talking to him in the book of Acts about righteousness, about self-control, about judgment, it says that Felix was afraid but didn't respond in saving faith. He said, go away for now. Some other convenient time I'll call for you and hear you further about this. Did he have a response? Yes. He had fear. There was evidence of the convicting work of the Holy Spirit showing him the need, but unfortunately he did not believe, he did not rely upon the Savior that the Apostle Paul was, re was telling him about. Maybe you've witnessed to somebody and they might go along with the fact that they're a sinner. They may go along with the very truth that Jesus Christ died on the cross. But they do not come to the point to say, I need him in my life and call out to him be the Lord and Savior. There may be evidence of even conviction, the work of the Holy Spirit convicting them. They may have a response, fear, or some way. That's demonic faith. If you're understanding what I'm talking about this morning, say amen. amen. That's pretty convincing. I don't want to be as clear as mud. <laughs> this is, I know, a little bit technical, but this is what James is dealing with. And we're going to keep going. Demons believe in shudder. I'm not going to look at these passages that I have on your notes, but I really want to encourage you to get in and see this. First of all, demons believe in the deity of Christ. They know He is the Son of God. They know who He is. Demons believe in a place of punishment. Remember, they said, oh, don't send us to the abyss. There's that herd of swine that we can go into them. 
They didn't want to go to the place of abyss. They believed and knew of a place of punishment. They had that understanding. Demons recognized the authority of Jesus. They said, send us to them. They understood that he had the authority, the power to do that. Demons submit to the power of his word because they did as he spoke. Obviously, that's not saving faith. But they believe and tremble. So there may be individuals respond to the sharing of the gospel in that manner. And, they're, and Satan loves it because they think that they're right with God. They think they have salvation, but they do not, biblically. They have demonic faith. See how Satan counterfeits? He's the great counterfeiter. You see that in the book of Revelation. What will happen during the tribulation period, the church raptured up, and then you have the tribulation period, and the Antichrist, the Greek prefix anti not only means against, it can mean instead of. Instead of Jesus Christ. And then you have the false, the, you have the Holy Trinity, but then you have the triunity, we were to say, I like to use the word trinity for holy trinity. But you have Satan, the dragon, you having him giving his authority to the Antichrist, the beast, and then who comes to exalt the Antichrist? The false prophet. You, so you see how, they're, how Satan is mimicking the very truth of God. So we should be shocked that multitudes think that they're saved when they're not because they have a demonic faith. And James is saying, this is, there are those saying, hey, we believe that God is one. They would say uh, the Shema in, in, in Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Yes, that's true. But were they saved? No. Well, he's going to go on to dynamic faith, verse 21. So we've seen dead faith and elect alone. We've seen demonic faith. There's intellect and emotion. But then there's dynamic faith. And I'm so thankful James included this. Aren't you grateful that he didn't stop there? <laughs> that he didn't stop with dead faith and demonic faith? But he demonstrated what faith with works looks like. In verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? Oh, many look at this and say, wait a second, there's a contradiction. Well, in fact, take your Bibles and go back to Romans chapter 4. And there isn't a contradiction. Critics of the Bible always want to try to get all excited and try to say the Bible's contradicting itself. You know, God is too wise to be contradicted, amen? amen. And He's the author of Scripture. Amen. This is God breathed. God breathed. It's inerrant because God doesn't make mistakes. It's reliable because God's reliable. He's the author. And so Romans chapter 4, remember again what Paul is dealing with. He is dealing with those that are trying to add works to salvation with the presentation of the gospel. And that's his very point in Romans chapter 4, begins verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham our forefather, or according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's Genesis 15, 6. Not only does the apostle Paul quote that, we're going to see in just a minute, that, that James quotes that same passage. That's quoted in Galatians, it's quoted here in Romans 4, and it's quoted by James in James 2. That very truth of Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. 
So how was Abraham saved? By faith. He believed God. And it was accounted unto him. Righteousness was imputed into his account. And Paul went on to say, now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. So when we're saved, we are declared righteous by God because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in his completed work. So he gives, he credits us with his righteousness. Now, people don't go around and saying, I feel justified today. It's an act that God does. He's done it. He declares righteous. He did that with Abraham. He does that with us today. And it's on the same basis. Not by works. By faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So back to James chapter 2, since we have just seen what Paul writes, so is this a contradiction if he's saying that Abraham our father justified by works? Well, it helps to see point A under dynamic faith is true saving faith leads to action. True saving faith leads to action. You receive salvation by faith to reveal it that the Lord is working through us see people think it's us trying to generate it ourselves we cannot generate those works by our flesh it's we're allowing God to be working through us it's that great truth of Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is therefore no longer I who live, but now it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. It is what Christ is doing. It's Christ in me. It's a, the Holy Spirit, what he is doing, exalting Christ in our lives. He's the one who is doing the works. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit, His work in the life of the believer. So justified by works, notice what Charles Ryrie in the Ryrie Study Bible notes. In Paul's writings, justification means to declare a sinner righteous in the sight of God. Here in James, it means to vindicate or to show to be righteous before God and men. To show righteousness. That, that person is declared righteous in the sight of God. But now it's revealing it to men. And he's going to give us the example in verse 22. You see, well, actually verse 21 was, not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar. You know what's interesting? This is between 30 and 40 years after Abraham was justified. When he believed on God in Genesis 15. About 30 or 40 years later, God tells him, take that promised son, Isaac, in which your descendants will be, and you are to go and offer him up as a sacrifice on the altar at Mount Moriah. You are to take him and do that. Now, did Abraham pass the test? Yeah. What happened? He obeyed God. He obeyed God. Genesis 22. 30 or 40 years later, you have the clear evidence that he trusted God. And so that's the point that James makes. When he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar, you see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected, or the idea of completed. Abraham's offering of Isaac demonstrated the genuineness of faith and the reality of his justification before God. 
James is emphasizing the vindication before others of a person's claim to salvation. That's what MacArthur notes. In verse 22, listen to the Berkeley version of that passage. You see how faith, how his faith cooperated with his works and how faith reached its supreme expression through his works. And then verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. <laughs> See James quoting that same passage? It was fulfilled. James wasn't saying that Abraham was saved by some works back here in Genesis. No. He said he was justified by faith he, when Abraham believed God, it was accounted unto him as righteousness. He was declared righteous in God's sight, but then it was made evident to everybody by his act of obedience, the ultimate act of obedience, of being willing to go and to offer up his son in obedience to God in Genesis 22. That proved the reality. It's kind of that saying, the proof is in the pudding. The proof is there. We're not saved by works. But a dynamic faith, a true saving faith, will give evidence. We don't confuse that with some type of instant sanctification. That, oh, we're saved and we arrived, you know, some sinless perfection. No, that's not the case. But it's a process that begins at the point of salvation. And doesn't end. Who's the ones that like to try to argue this? Those that have the intellectual assent. Those that have the dead faith. The one that says, I'll show you my salvation. You, you can talk about your works, but I have my faith. And then he says, but what if I show you my faith by my works? Those works are coming with true salvation. That is revealed to man. And you always have to go back to the audience. Is James dealing with the same issues on justification that the Apostle Paul was? Well, the Apostle Paul had those that were trying to add works to salvation by trying to keep the law. The Judaizers were big opponents of the Apostle Paul. James isn't dealing really with the Judaizers. You know who he's dealing with? He's dealing with those that are saying, oh, yeah, we believe these facts. Abraham was our father, so we know we're right. We're going to be in the kingdom. We're saved. That's enough. That's who James is dealing with. Those that have a misunderstanding of what true biblical salvation is. By faith... He was justified before God, and his righteousness declared by works he was justified before men, and his righteousness demonstrated. I can't say it any better than what Wearsby just did. It's demonstrated. His salvation. There's a second new there's a second Old Testament character that he's going to talk about with dynamic faith. Verse 25. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. You can read about her story in Joshua 2. The, the spies that came to Rahab's house. They came to Rahab's house because not only was she a harlot, but she also was like running an inn. And that was the place that they came to stay. She came and she said, our hearts are melted because we have heard what God has done and how he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. What he did there at the Red Sea. We have heard all about it, how he defeated these great kings. Our hearts have, are, are, have melt, he, she was saying, the people there. But what happened? You know how she was saved? The exact same way that Abraham was. 
she believed God. She didn't even have a, a lot that she knew, but what she knew, she believed and she trusted. And she gave evidence to that trust. She gave evidence. It was what she did. Now she was saved by faith, but it was demonstrated by what she did. Isn't it great that we have that example? You have Abraham, and now you have a Gentile harlot, who, by the way, ends up in the lineage of our Lord, Jesus Christ. She is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And what a powerful example of dynamic faith. James ends this section in verse 26. For just as the body without the spirit is dead. The word death means separation. Separation is when somebody's spirit, when the spirit separates from the body. That's death. That's death. So just even as that happens, somebody tries to say have faith, there's no works. When the works are separated from faith, that's dead. That's dead. When people have intellectual sense and there's the emotion, that's demonic faith. Oh, but when you have salvation revealed by biblical works, that is dynamic faith. And that is God's plan. I'm not going to take time to look at this, but write down in your notes Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Read all those together. We usually stop with verse 9, but go Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, and we will see God's, the teaching of salvation by grace through faith alone. And then God's plan for the believer, what he does to that individual. A body without the spirit. This is faith demonstrated. So we have James in this passage is dealing with dead faith, demonic faith, and dynamic faith. Where are you today? What type of faith do you have? Do you know without a shadow of doubt that you have relied upon the completed work of Jesus Christ and you have called out to Him to come into your life, to forgive you your sins, to be your Lord and Savior. Maybe somebody's here and says, you know, I know that Jesus died on the cross and He was buried and He rose again, but I am not relying upon what He did for me. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For He, God the Father, made Him, God the Son, who knew no sin, to become sin for us. There's the substitutionary atonement. Jesus Christ died on the cross for us, sinners. Jesus never sinned, but He died for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him, in Christ. That we can have His righteousness. That's what God gives when we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, when we have placed and relying upon what He has done for us. That's the difference that we must grasp. And that dynamic faith there is evidence. That true saving faith is revealed before people. What God's doing. And that's what James was talking about. Faith without works is dead. Are you here and maybe you're like the, even the demons and the demons believed and trembled. But obviously it was not saving faith. Maybe you're here today and there's an issue of obedience. 
Abraham obeyed God. It's one of the tremendous pictures we see in the Old Testament of what Jesus Christ would do at the cross. Abraham. In fact, Isaac in Genesis 22 was called, Isaac was called Abraham's only son. Because he was the promised son in which the descendants were to come through. And Abraham was willing and took Isaac. But you know who else was willing? Who was willing to be bound? He was so much younger than, obviously, than his father. He was so much stronger. He could have resisted, couldn't he? But he didn't. And as Abraham laid Isaac upon that altar, and Abraham had his knife, but then what did Abraham hear? Stop, for now I know that you are not withholding even your own son. He passed the test. But friend, many years later, on the cross of Calvary, as Jesus Christ took our sins upon himself, there was no voice that said stop. Because Jesus Christ is the good shepherd who give, nobody took his life. He gave his life. He gave his life. Back here in Genesis 22, it says that this place is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. It was provided. Jesus finished the redeeming work. Abraham's act of obedience. Jesus, the willing Lamb of God, who gave his life for us. You might say, I know I'm saved. I just ask you this question. Is there some area where you're not living in obedience to him? And are you willing to say, Lord, I'm sorry for being disobedient to you. And I want you to have your way in every area of my life. When we would pray that, hallowed be your name, I want your name to be honored in every area of my life, Lord. And where it's not, that I would be faithful to confess that to you and forsake that sin. Let us pray and then we're going to have an invitation. Father, we come to you right now. We thank you that we see in, in this passage that there was examples of dynamic faith, true biblical faith, and it was demonstrated. And oh Lord, we would ask that we would be surrendered to you and allow you to be doing a mighty work through us. What you do, it, it's not uh, a sense of pride of works here saying, look at what I've done. Because everything that is done in our lives, it's by grace, your grace. The Apostle Paul would say, I am what I am by the grace of God. And so, Lord, if there's some area even in our lives that, that we're being disobedient to you, some area that needs to be surrendered, I pray that even this day, in this moment, that we'd be honest with you and allow you to do your work in our lives. Have your way in this invitation, we pray, whatever the needs, that we will come. That we wouldn't put it off, but we would come even this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand as we...